Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, buenas, buena tarde, buenas tardes. Uh, thank you very much for joining in this uh, online event, uh, jointly co-organized by uh, CIDOP, the Barcelona Center for International Affairs and Peer Research Center, um, the fact tank uh, covering uh, polls and opinion all around the world. Today we are here uh, with a panel of experts to discuss uh, the stake of multilateralism the, the, and also the future of uh, multilateralism, precisely at the time when the United Nations are celebrating its 75th anniversary. It's a commemoration of what has been achieved so far. Um, to what extent have multilateral organizations fulfilled the role they were given to uh, when they were founded after World War II, but also to assess the challenges that they are facing as of today due to the coronavirus crisis, but also due to the increasing geopolitical tensions in the global order. So to do that, uh, we count on a few expert voices, uh, starting with uh, James Bell, who is uh, uh, the person at Peer Research who is responsible for this report that has been uh, surveying uh, in 14 countries what uh, people think about multilateralism, what they think about the United States and nations, and to what extent multilateralism is still in good shape for um, jointly addressing uh, global uh, threats, global risks, uh, global events, uh, and, and to what extent is this still an effective institution. Then we also have with us Cristina Manzano, director of S Global. Um, she uh, has been working for a long time on multilateral issues, not only uh, from a multilateral perspective, but also covering widely all discussions on sustainable development goals and particularly gender. So she is also with us. Then we have Paul Vargas, who is a researcher at CIDOP and who has been um, uh, coordinating uh, our last report on the future of uh, multilateralism, a report called UN at 75, Rethinking Multilateralism, assessing not only the current uh, needs of the organization, but also ways forward, areas in which it could play a more powerful role. And then last but not least, we have Marie van den Drische, who is a researcher at Esade Geo, um, uh, uh, a center on geopolitics and geoeconomics of ESADE, uh, the university, and who has also been contributing to our report uh, with a, um, a chapter on climate change. So this is the panel for this afternoon's discussion. We will be uh, live streaming this from this event from our YouTube channel, uh, which can then be accessed anytime in our YouTube uh, platform at CDOP. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here. Thank you all for, for tuning in. Thank you all for uh, the panelists for being, for being with us. Let me move immediately to James Bell for a presentation of the study on and survey on the uh, state of mind on uh, the United Nations. James, the uh, floor is yours. James, you're, mu you're, you're muted. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for that uh, instruction, the unmute, but also for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to join this panel uh, for a conversation about multilateralism. I was checking my diary from several years ago. It was actually three years ago, just a little more, that I was at CIDOP. Uh, in Barcelona, I'm just only sad that I'm not physically present in Barcelona, my, one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, I want to keep my comments short. I know we have several panelists that have uh, done research and are going to bring their own perspectives to the question of the future of multilateralism. Uh, I think this is a great uh, convergence of research streams. Uh, CIDOP's report on you know the future of multilateralism as the UN turns 75. We too have been thinking in that context about what it means uh, for publics in key countries uh, to think about international cooperation and what terms. Uh, are they supportive of cooperating with other countries? And as already mentioned, uh, how might this have been affected by the experiences that people have had with COVID-19, the pandemic? So let me highlight a few of our findings. And really, I look forward to the conversation. Uh, our mission at the Pew Research Center is to remain nonpartisan, 
non-advocacy, we don't comment on policy, but what we really value is dialogue, public dialogue. And to me, this event is a perfect expression of how we hope to engage in dialogues about important issues, such as international cooperation and the issues that international cooperation may uh, have to take on in the uh, months and years ahead. So in terms of key findings from our study, again, it's 14 country study, I'll readily admit that there's a much bigger world out there, but we, like so many, had our normal practice of business interrupted by COVID-19. Uh, we had hoped to survey in 50 countries, 5-0, around the globe, in the global north and global south, but that was just not possible because we collect our data face-to-face -face in many countries uh, south of the equator. So we focused on 14 countries that are among the top 20 donors to the United Nations. And our thought is, here are a set of publics who really, in their support or lack of support for international cooperation and for funding and backing the UN are a consequential group of citizens. And we're really curious to know what are they thinking about international cooperation in this year, if I may, of COVID. So I'll start by saying we actually surveyed many more countries in 2019 than we did this past summer. 34 countries specifically. And in 2019, before COVID, there was widespread support for the ideal, the ideal of international cooperation. We asked about preference for uh, a world in which countries are basically competing with each other and pursuing their own interests versus a world in which countries are cooperating for the common good. And overwhelmingly across the countries we surveyed in 2019, public support was strongly in favor, overwhelmingly in favor of a community of nations working together. And that includes 12 of the 14 countries we surveyed this past summer saying clearly, eight and 10 saying they prefer a world in which countries are cooperating together. And that includes countries such as Spain. So we have that general orientation of publics in favor of the idea of international cooperation. What's happened since COVID-19 broke out and just turned our whole world upside down, has that support for international cooperation sustained? And what we see is that overall majorities in the countries we surveyed this past summer are still in favor of international cooperation. However, it's not at that ideal level of eight and 10 supporting it. We're actually coming in across the 14 countries, a median of six and 10, saying that they support international cooperation. Specifically, and I think this is a high bar we're presenting to our survey respondents, specifically six and 10 supporting, taking into account the interests of other countries, even if it means compromise. So to me, that is you know, a test of how far publics will go. They're willing to follow the interests of other countries uh, for the sake of international cooperation. That is uh, something I think is worth noting. We also find basically six in 10 also telling us in this past summer survey that they think international cooperation, greater international cooperation would have mitigated or reduced the impact of COVID-19. So the lesson that we see a majority taking away in the publics we survey from the COVID-19 experience is that international cooperation greater international cooperation would have been a good thing. So you have that sense of ideal support, then you have the test of a real challenge, a pressing challenge in COVID-19, and you can see that majorities still support international cooperation. However, it's not at the ideal level. So that's something I think would be interesting to talk about with people joining us today, the difference between the ideal and the reality. And then let me turn to our findings about the UN, because we cooperated with the UN and trying to get this these set of findings out so they could be incorporated into the overall UN 75 initiative, be part of the data stream the UN's looking at as it thinks about its role in the world. And what do we find about the United Nations? Well, you're gonna hear this uh, ratio again and again from me today, I guess, six and 10 are in our study and the 14 countries are favorable towards the United Nations. That's an overall rating. WHO, Six and 10 basically say it did a good job handling COVID-19. So this has not been a bad moment for the UN. Overall, majorities are saying it doing well. What's really interesting in our study is that we asked about what in general does the United Nations do? And here we're getting a clear reading 
strong majorities recognizing the core elements of the UN mission, which is peace and security, which is human rights and economic development, sustainable development. Each of those registers very highly among a majority of our respondents as core to what the UN does. Where the UN struggles a bit in terms of public perceptions is whether it takes ordinary citizens into account, the interests of those citizens into account as it goes about its work. Roughly half say that's true, which means that's a very divided view of the UN in terms of how it operates. And there's about the same level of questioning of whether the UN always delivers when it comes to solving international problems. The example of COVID-19 getting a positive rating in terms of how the UN's handle it, notwithstanding, there are questions about how the UN does when it comes to international problems, specific problems, and how it deals with those. So thinking about these findings, what I'd like to propose to the panel as I turn it over to my colleagues is uh, several questions that I hope that we can discuss in different ways, which is I'd be very curious about this group because I've thought about it a lot. Do our findings and the findings that they've also generated create a picture of optimism or pessimism about the future of multilateralism? I'd really like to know what people think about that. Where is global leadership going to come from? Who's going to lead globally in the future at the, in terms of states? But also, what about global institutions like the UN? Who's going to lead? And then finally, because of my personal interest and our focus, what is the role of ordinary citizens? What is the role of the public in multilateralism going forward? Looking forward to the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Um, You've done uh, my, perfectly my job because you've introduced the topics that I wanted to raise also to, to, to the rest of the panelists. So, so uh, you've made my job easier. And I'm particularly interested as well to turn into, uh, now turning to, to Christina, um, on the seemingly contradiction that you put forward. We are living at a time, particularly with coronavirus, but not only with coronavirus, whereby multilateral cooperation is necessary. You can think about Corona, but you can see, think about climate change. You can think about the global value change. You can think about um, the, the, the recovery after coronavirus in terms of socioeconomic needs and so on and so forth. All of these domains that cannot be solved by one, one single country, that cannot be solved even by a grouping of countries, but where uh, some necessary level of cooperation, of multilateral cooperation is needed. Yet, at the same time, we are inheriting the consequences of many years of uh, my country first sort of thinking by the main uh, international leaders, a tendency to see international relations as a zero sum game. So that means what I gain for my country, you have to lose it for yours. And these two needs or these two realities, the need for multilateral cooperation and the uh, uh, barriers to international cooperation and, and, and leadership organized around multilateralism is what makes the work of multilateral institutions very, very hard. So let me turn to Cristina Manzano, now director of S Global, to answer to this first question. What's at stake today for uh, multilateral cooperation? Cristina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, first of all, congratulations for your report. I think it's really interesting, timely, of course, and necessary. But I also want to thank James for, for the work that Pew Research does. I, uh, as a journalist and, and as, a, as the leader of a publication on global affairs, we constantly quote you, use your data, because um, you've asked about the role of citizens. And I think that is so vital in our world, not to just look at what governments and states do, but also to know what and, and to know based on, on data, not just on, on impressions and opinions, what the citizens want and would like to support. I think that is critical for, for our work. So congratulations to, to, your, to you both. Um, what is the stake? Well, my, my impression is that uh, what is the stake is the, the multilateralism as we've known it so far. And, and when we talk about it, there is a, a part of, um, of course, of logics and, and uh, util utilitarianism and so on. But there is also a lot of nostalgia, nostalgia for a world we seem to be losing, uh, the world uh, that we envision or our um, predecessors envision after World War II. 
and that uh, now has completely changed. So yes, uh, multilateralism is is under attack on many fronts, from national interests. You've mentioned that, Paul, uh, from from uh, the pure utilitarianism that some members um, profess, like for instance, China. Uh, China is a, a, a keen supporter of uh, the multilateral system of the UN as far as it's of uh, use for them. And we've seen it every every day. Um, but there is also a lot of frustration um, on their in, uh, the inefficiencies of, of the system. Um, you've mentioned climate change, which is one of our major challenges. But let me also remind you, for instance, governance of the internet, which is the major, one of the major, not only player, keys of, of, of our global world and um, and uh, yet we haven't reached a governance system via the multilateral system that we have. It, it, it has gone completely independent. It has gone through private actors. So that is a, a proof of how difficult um, it is to combine the system that we built 75 years ago and the needs that we have now. Um, however, I also think that the multilateral system is much more resilient than we tend to believe and that sometimes headlines uh, make us believe. And uh, why do I say so? Because um, even if we see the, the inefficiencies, even if we mm, complain constantly about how uh, useless UN, and let me be so bluntly useless, uh, the UN has been, for instance, in, in the latest conflicts like Syria, like Libya, like Yemen, uh, but still the UN, uh, and I'm putting all the all the focus on the UN. Is still the major provider of uh, uh, humanitarian aid and assistance, and uh, it is uh, the UN Agency for Refugees is the one really dealing with that flow of of a uh, force uh, people, a uh, force displaced people that we are seeing all over, all around the world. So um, it is uh, heard over and over again these days. But if we hadn't had the the United Nations, we should have, uh, we should be inventing it now. So I, my clear support for, for that. Um, we are also seeing that gap between what James just told us, the support of the citizens in many countries, and maybe we can extrapolate that to more countries, and the decisions by their politicians. And um, that is also a clear sign of our times, and we are seeing that in many countries of course, we are seeing that in Spain at all levels, but we are seeing that gap growing and growing between what citizens think and believe and what politicians are doing. And that um, applies to your question, James, about the leadership. Um, I won't be answering that right now, but it, it, it is, in fact, a very relevant question. Who will be really leading that reform that the multilateral system needs? And um, there is another frustration there. Um, which is the United Nations has been trying to reform itself for years, but we know that the devil is in the details. We know that the, 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 the sin is in the own creation of, of uh, the structure of the United Nations, and it will be very, very hard to reform um, right now, as, as it is now. So having said that, on the other hand, I tend to be on the side of the optimist. Uh, why do I say so? Because going back to the citizens, we have been seeing citizens going to the streets and claiming for more uh, cooperation at many levels. And I really like the movements uh, pushed by, uh, forward by, by the young people. And of course, here comes um, always to, to our minds the future for uh, the Fridays for Future movement, the Greta Thunbergs of this world, the Extinction, Extinction Rebellion, all those movements. Uh, for people claiming all across the world for more multilateral cooperation, for more cooperation. Uh, we can give it the, the, the adjectives that, that we want. Um, I'm also quite optimistic because these days um, we, I'm seeing so many efforts, initiatives by so many actors in the civil society uh, trying to identify the way this multilateral system can go forward. And um, Maybe you know we are in this bubble and we are attending many of these events, most of them virtual these days, and we are seeing all these efforts around uh, this idea of how to advance uh, a real, useful, and and uh, efficient multilateral system. But all those brains, all those ideas are there, and um, even if it the political will may not be there right now, even if it is not the right moment to do it. 
we have the technical uh, solutions, or at least we have some technical solutions there. So um, that is in itself, I think, a, a very good uh, piece of news. And then I also think that the multilateralism in, in uh, multilateralism in, in coming years will, will take other forms. And let me uh, mention here one of the of the articles of the report by Sido, uh, the one by Edouard Soler on interregionalism. Um, and and he has the, the author asked, is it going to be the saver or it's it the last refuge uh, for for multilateralism? I am among those who believe that regionalism is also a good. Um, thing that uh, in uh, when we get stuck because we are not able to agree all together unanimously on certain issues, there are initiatives moving ahead. And I'd like to mention here, because we have the, the, always the example of the European Union with our backs and forth and, and, and so on, but I'd like to bring the example of the American continental free zone, uh, free, free trade zone, sorry, which is uh, been set in place, which has been uh, a bit delayed because of the COVID-19, but now it's announced to start really working on January. And it will bring together, if it works properly, it will bring, bring together the largest free trade zone in the world um, uh, with, with enormous figures of people involved, tra um, products involved, and, and money involved. I think that is a good. I don't see that as a competi competition for the rest of the multilateral system. I think if countries learn how to work together and to cooperate, they will be more um, red. They, they will be readier then to to cooperate at the global level. So uh, let me finish with that. I, I'm seeing new forms of, of multilateralism at the regional level, local level, and uh, and um, transversal levels too, um, and. Just let me finish with saying that we need to also incorporate in our conversation the other stakeholders. We need to include corporations and civil society. Without them, any multilateral option in the future won't not be very, very useful. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Uh, absolutely right. I mean, multilateralism is certainly not a thing only of the UN or even only of uh, states around the world. It's something that involves many other actors who have also their agendas, but also the, the, the capacity to, to, to foster uh, international cooperation. So I totally, I totally share your views on this. Um, let me uh, remind all the, all the audience uh, and those who are following this debate, that both reports are uh, available online. So we have um, uh, Pew Research uh, uh, report on international cooperation, welcomed across uh, 14 advanced economies that is available online. We'll be posting that in our Twitter account as we as we speak. And also our report on UN at 75, rethinking multilateral, multilateralism, also available uh, through our website at, at CDOP. So to introduce that report, we have Paul Vargas, who has been coordinating the efforts of uh, many of our researchers at CDOP, writing uh, their pieces from, from the different points of view on, on, on the state of multilateralism and the main challenges ahead. Um, so I will give now Paul the floor for a presentation of the main findings of the report and also what's, uh, what's at stake, what's ahead of us in terms of the reform and opportunities for a more relevant uh, UN system. Paul, floor is yours. Uh, Paul, you're, you're, you're muted. No, I think no. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you, Paul, for this and to the, to the panelists. Uh, it's a pleasure for me, actually, to present this uh, report with the title United Nations at 75, Rethinking Multilateralism, which has been published in English and, and Spanish, uh, in which CDOP researchers and others have contributed with the general idea of addressing this crisis uh, of multilateralism. Um, in particular, the, what the different chapters have done has been to examine how the UN has responded to the different challenges of international relations, more traditional challenges such as uh, peace, security, uh, or development, and the more uh, recent ones such as the, the, health, the current health crisis or, or climate change. And this analysis takes place in the context of the 17, uh, the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Um, that 
the, the UN has had this this event all, all all year has had this this dialogues in order to 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 reinvent to reimagine multilateralism but this week has commemorated this anniversary and in an unusual format because the the the, the um, the room was empty. There were no state leaders uh, joining the session, but there was the, the Secretary General Guterres, who announced, uh, who talked about the need to to reimagine uh, multilateralism, to rethink it, and to make it more, um, more to, to make it real in a, in, a, in international relations, which is which is um, um, is increasingly. Um, or there are increasing tensions between great powers. There are fractures, social and economic, and therefore this multilateralism was, um, according to Guterres, more necessary than ever. There has been two two moments, two great moments for multilateralism in in the past seventy five years, uh, and the two these two great moments have been after after a war. The first one was after the Second World War, and of course. There was after the ashes of of the the Second World War. There, there was the need to cooperate uh, among the allies who had won the the, the war and to rebuild um, the world according to uh, respect for human rights, according to the sovereign to respect for sovereignty of of nation states, and 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 even trying to to to, to increase the number of of states with uh, with the support of the self determination of colonized. And nations. That was in 1945, in the 50s. So that was that was the first moment of, of multilateralism, and in which the UN uh, received um, confidence and was was celebrated. The second moment was in the 1990s. Without the Soviet horizon at the end of the Cold War, there was consensus that the the world was one, and that uh, the the states could cooperate and could envision a world of um, of cooperation, trust democratization and liberalization it was uh, it was the un who put forward an agenda for democratization and for doing peace building peace building understood as as the process of post conflict recovery so the un would support these nations in order to 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 build peace and to to build a international peace um, um, at, at the global level so for instance there was also in the 1990s the the, the, the initial moments of uh, of, of the, the fight against climate change. Uh, there was the Kyoto Protocol, also the, the framework uh, to, to reduce greenhouse um, or gases of green, greenhouse uh, effects and so on. So it was these two were the, the big moments of, of the UN. After that, the, the UN has, has, uh, has entered into, into a crisis. Notice that these two great moments arrived after, after a war. And, and this is because of, of two main reasons. First, because after a war, you need, you need to cooperate. Everyone agrees that that's the only way to move forward, to rebuild what has been destroyed. And the second one, the second reason, also important, is because after a war, there is a, well, uh, there is a party that wins. There is a, winners can impose their views. Uh, they can impose the peace. And there is consensus that they are the winners, and therefore they can dictate or they can... Um, write the the future of of international relations today um we are not an after war moment um in, in a sense you could argue that we are trying to prevent several wars or several conflicts but we, there is no no consensus that the war has ended and therefore there is no great power or or group of powers who could dictate or could write uh, the new the, the the new rules in international relations we are in a multipolar world where the the US has withdrawn from from its leadership. Um, Europe Europe has has lost its 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 coherence or determination. There is great power competition. It's it's real that the US and and China are are increasingly confronted. So no vision can can impose itself. And it is in this context of um, there is no no peace or no no after war moment and there is no leadership which makes it very difficult for the UN in the 17th anniversary to find the consensus for its reform and to find the consensus for addressing the, the, the key challenges in international relations. Thank you, Paul. Um, 
thank you for uh, for this introduction to to our uh, to our report. Um, let me uh, also move to another author of the of the report who is not with uh, with CDOP. Uh, she's working with with Sade Geo as a, as a researcher there, but uh, who regularly contributes to our to our pieces, and that is uh, that is Marie van den Driesche, uh, who has been working a lot on 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 energy issues, but also on climate change. And that's actually what uh, what she writes about in our in our uh, in our report. By saying basically that um, what we are uh, witnessing now with uh, with uh, with coronavirus and 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 and, and the debates it has generated around multilateralism and the state of multilateralism also um, could be um, related and or, or could be part of the debate on any crisis that. Uh, comes as a consequence of, of climate change. And that this is not only a question of our time, of the multilateral organizations that we have now and the capacity to confront these challenges today, but also something uh, very present in the minds of future generations. So um, what can we say about the role of the UN in, in tackling climate change? What lessons have we learned so far and what most importantly, remains to be done. Marie, floor is yours. Thanks very much, Paul. And thanks also for, uh, for the invitation to contribute to the report. Um, climate change has come up uh, quite a lot already in this conversation. Uh, and I want to thank also uh, the Pew Center with their fantastic research uh, on, on opinions. Uh, I think we all use it regularly uh, when doing our, our research. Um, and so to, to, to grab one of those points, in fact, in, in the newest report, um, it is stated that 70% of the uh, citizens surveyed in these 14 countries find uh, climate change to be a major threat to their country. Um, so really, it's an issue that's at the top of the agenda. At this point, it's an issue that the UN also has put at the top of this agenda, the UN uh, Secretary General as well. And it's an issue that the UN has, has worked on for a long time. As, as Paul just mentioned, uh, 1992 was when the Framework Convention on climate change was, was signed at this big conference in, in Rio when environmental issues came to the, to the top of the agenda. And it was when states, all states, decided together that their objective was to prevent dangerous anthrop anthropogenic interference with the climate system. This is about 30 years now, uh, 30 years ago now, um, and I would say that uh, countries are still trying and the UN is still trying. Uh, we have actually warmed one degree over pre-industrial levels already, um, so that uh, interference is already underway. Um, this is all to say that we are facing a, a huge, huge problem, uh, which I think the UN has a huge role in solving as well. Um, but let me just um, put this on the table right away. We're also facing an extremely complex issue. I think it's one of the most uh, complex, of course, there are many, but they're one of the most complex to solve. It's an issue of, 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 of collective action uh, where um, if we do not all contribute to the solution to this problem, all of us uh, will, will face the consequences. It's a problem where there are historical responsibilities to be taken, taken into account, and that makes the negotiation all the more difficult. It's an issue that uh, touches on core interests for a lot of countries because their economies are so linked to their energy models and therefore their emissions uh, that all of this is, is so tightly wound that it becomes uh, very difficult to discuss. And on top of that, there's the whole free rider issue of the question of, OK, look, I'll, I'll put in my two cents. I will do the work. But if others do not, they will be benefiting from my action um, and, and ride for them. They'll be, they'll be along the ride for, for free, right? So basically, uh, given this, this extreme complexity, given the extreme complexity of negotiating among uh, these, uh, this number of countries together, uh, the UN has, has been working through, through multiple models. On the one hand, I think we do need to highlight here uh, its contribution, uh, scientifically speaking. So since 1988, uh, the, through the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change, uh, they, there have been, they have been generating a body of scientific uh, evidence, collecting all of the scientific research that is out there um, to, to create this authoritative base, uh, which can be used to formulate policy. And I think it's a contribution that is sometimes uh, forgotten, but particularly in the context, for example, of, of COVID, it's, the, the scientific angle cannot be neglected. So let's, let's put that there. It's, uh, it's underway, and I think it's a very important contribution. In terms of the governance, so not the research on the actual problem itself and potential solutions, but in terms of what we're going to do about it, multiple um, models have been, have been tried up. 
to know, right? So we have um, already mentioned by, by Paul the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and the idea there was, let's do this the classic way. Let's regulate from the top down. Let's say, look, uh, this country needs to reduce its emissions by this much, this much, this much, and we'll regulate that, we'll enforce that. The issue was that this was signed, um, the commitments were undertaken by developed uh, countries. It took a very long time to ratify uh, because of multiple issues. And so by the end of it, although uh, it was implemented, the effect on emissions was, was quite small because at that point, our world economy was already changing and there were other countries starting to emit more, such as the emerging economies, right? So, I mean, that was a base. That was uh, how things started out. It was the way that environmental issues were often uh, regulated. Um, but it was clear that there, we needed to take a next step. We needed to go to the global level, that just regulating the small group of countries wasn't going to be enough to, to address this problem. And this is where uh, this famous uh, summit in Copenhagen in 2009 comes up, where uh, countries tried to reach a global, a binding global agreement on climate change, and it was an utter failure. Uh, it was, it was uh, a terrible, utter failure uh, in the context also of an economic crisis at the time. And it was a moment of despair, I think, for, for climate diplomacy. Um, yet, uh, from those ashes arose in 2015 the Paris Agreement, right? Uh, which is this model uh, that is both bottom up and top down. So we have the countries that now make commitments of how much they are willing and able to do to contribute to trying to solve or mitigate the issue of climate change. And this top down goal that we're going to try to make sure that the uh, global temperatures do not rise by more than 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels. Enshrining that goal of the 1.5 degrees is actually one of the great contributions, I think, of uh, the UN's uh, efforts on climate change. Just having that frame out there makes a target for uh, a lot of the policy um, that, is, that is developed, right? Um, and some would say, I mean, there's, there's basically two schools when you look at what the UN has done in climate change and, and particularly about the Paris Agreement. Um, some will say that it's toothless. There is a voluntary scheme uh, and there are no enforcement uh, mechanisms. So, so what's, how, how is this going to work, right? And others would argue, no, we tried to make uh, a scheme that was much more enforceable, et cetera, et cetera, but that didn't work. And we arrived at this model, which can be an accelerator, uh, a catalyst in the words of, of Thomas Hale, uh, in order to get more and more countries on board, in order to create a virtuous cycle of climate action. The idea is that when you see another country making uh, promises with regard to climate change, your citizens, as uh, Christina brought up, I think, initially and, and, and as well uh, in the beginning of the, of the webinar, um, your citizens will be uh, looking at that um, and, and may say, hey, if these are if these countries able to do it, why, why are we not doing so, right? Um, it also involves the Paris Agreement uh, non-state actors such as corporations, uh, which is another point that Christina brought up. So I think that um, in terms of what the UN has done in climate change, the Paris Agreement uh, is a tremendous contribution. And this year, uh, bringing back the, the COVID side of things, was the moment to see whether this was all going to work or not, right? But COVID intervened. And so the uh, summit that was set to take place this year in Glasgow has been postponed. Um, and uh, this was the moment when countries were supposed to submit new and more ambitious plans uh, to the Paris Agreement. So I think we all kind of, uh, as, as climate analysts um, uh, at that moment, had the question, is, is, is momentum going to stall? The question was already, is Paris going to work? Are we going to see this more virtuous action? But on top of that, we now have this COVID crisis and, and this economic crisis. Is this going to work? And I think that precisely uh, the UNGA, the UN General Assembly, last week gave a pretty important indication here uh, with the announcement uh, by Xi Jinping that China will be aiming for carbon neutrality by 2060. Um, so we can talk about uh, the reasons and for the timing of this announcement, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure there's also geopolitical issues at play, economic issues at play. But the fact of using this forum uh, in front of uh, all the countries of the world to announce this in this year, the year when we were supposed to see the updates of, of Paris has been has been very important. And so I think that in general, kind of to, to wrap up for now, um, generating this, this space, generating this model, trying to generate this uh, catalytic effect uh, is an incredibly important contribution that the, that the UN is making to this issue. Thanks, uh, thanks, Marie. Um, I will go back to this uh, um, a bit later on, 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 on collective action because it's precisely 
collective action and the generation of public goods that I think are quite important features of the UN if it is to be perceived, and I'm going back to James now, as a, as a, as a, useful, uh, a useful tool by citizens, and thus it has uh, some more legitimacy or good legitimacy and, and good perception by, by citizens on its usefulness. But uh, before I, uh, we go back to these sort of discussions, let me ask uh, James to go a bit uh, further and delve deeper into what are the different perceptions across um, the different countries and also groupings of people in their um, perception of uh, multilateral organizations. Um, I would like to know uh, if, if it is really a global conversation that is emerging on the on the on the future of multilateralism or the stake of multilateralism, or rather a fragmented one, and happening in different countries across different groupings of people in very different directions. So that would need, in addition to the initial remarks that he made on the state of multilateralism in general, also to see what differences are there between countries and, and groupings of people. I, I take the opportunity now to uh, tell all those, uh, all the audience that is uh, that is following us uh, online, that if there is any question that they would like to 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 ask to the panelists, to do so through the YouTube channel, um, I will collect them and, and then ask uh, the speakers. Now I would uh, do a second round of very short comments by by the different speakers. So James, um, floor is yours for a second second thoughts on this. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's a very important point, and I do uh, recommend that people take a close look at the report that we published uh, last Tuesday to get some of the more granular findings. But to summarize some of the key ones, uh, we've had mention already from the other panelists about uh, the, you know, the role of the younger generation. And we do see evidence in our survey that we did this summer that in these 14 countries at least, that the, the younger people are more open, more supportive of international engagement, more favorable towards the United Nations, uh, tend to rate it more highly in its handling of COVID-19. And that is certainly a factor to consider that, is this one conversation across the globe and are all groups, as we might think about them, on the same page? Well, young people just seem to be a source of potential greater support for international cooperation. I would add that we also find that those with higher levels of education tend to be more supportive of international cooperation. Those are two broad trends that we see. I think another maybe less positive uh, finding is that there is division and significant division. Uh, fragmentation was mentioned. Um, to the degree that people are familiar with the, the situation in the United States, we have intense political polarization in the United States. And I must say, if you look in the report, you'll find that people who support the Republican Party in our country are much less sanguine about the UN, its performance, and generally support for international cooperation and compromise with other countries, whereas those who support the Democratic Party uh, lean in the opposite direction, are much more in favor of international cooperation. And I would note that while the fragmentation politically in individual countries is not identical, we do see in general those who identify uh, with right-leaning parties uh, in countries like Spain or Germany, uh, across Europe, these people tend to be more skeptical about international cooperation. So I think it's a very important point. We're not all on the same page necessarily. The general findings are positive, but there is debate at multiple levels, uh, as the point was made, including inside some of these countries. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, James, because uh, you're raising a very important issue to me uh, now, which is the politicization of the UN and of the multilateral system in general. And politicization happens, but not uh, across all uh, spheres of population at the same time, um, and not all levels of contestation by all population at the same time. So it's very important to go a bit deeper into, into this and see what sort of groups are, are more uh, supportive of the work of the, of, of the UN and what other groups are precisely using the UN uh, or the multilateral organizations in general um, as, a, as, a, as the... As, well, 
challenging their 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 viability by saying other things, also contesting more the political order in general. And this is where uh, populism comes in, and and so on and so forth. But uh, one aspect of this that I'm very interested in to hear from you, and I will turn to this this question to to Christina. Is that perhaps we've lost a bit of faith in the UN as a um, global governance or a global government uh, for the whole of the people of the planet, and, and, and as, a, as, a, as an organization that can set forth um, uh, some joint understanding on what's stake for all of us, right? So this more global attitude towards the UN, if I may say it this way, has been lost across uh, the last in the last few few years. However, there are other agendas that have been put forward and that relate more to policy developments, to more specific aspects of the UN work um, that have been quite powerful. Uh, we can think about the SDGs, for instance, or we can think about the work of the UN on gender equality. These are aspects that relate less to the politics of the UN and more to the policies of the UN or to the policies of some sort of global governance that these institutions can can uh, can can provide for. Um, what are the prospects of these uh, specific two agendas on the SDGs and uh, and the and the uh, gender equality agendas of the UN? Is, are these um, uh, areas of hope for the future of the UN, Christina? Um, I could say the word I would use is bittersweet um, because. Um, the, the governance model um, that we can apply to, especially the SDGs, is exactly the same as Marie described with climate change. It's a tailored um, strategy where each country uh, compromises and commits to to certain to obtain certain targets from each, each um, goal uh, in a certain way. Um, but I say bittersweet because yes, there has been uh, steps forward, but at the same time, uh, we are far from there and uh, from from the goals yet very far. As the the latest report of the Secretary General on the on the evolution of the SDGs um, states, um, the, the the best summary for all these two agendas, broad, very broad agendas, is uh, something that Maria Solanas from Elcano wrote in an article in the Slovak, talking about the Beijing conference, which also commemorates uh, the, its anniversary, the 25th anniversary this year. And she says, we we have seen step a few steps forward, a few steps backwards, and new challenges. And that that's why I say Peter Sweet. Yes, there have been steps forward in every in every level, but uh, also backlashes. In, in, for instance, in the gender agenda, we see it clearly there has been a reaction in some countries, uh, and all the gender issues have been put on on hold. And the worst part of that is that the pandemic, the COVID nineteen, has brought a, a very unwilling uh, element here, and it has brought new pressure on poverty, on education, and health, uh, which is which are three of the major SDGs and also on, on gender equality. And we are seeing all these reports about how the COVID pandemic is, is affecting mostly women because we are um, in the sectors, in the care sector more than men, because our mm, salaries are lower, because many people, uh, many women are in the informal sectors in, in many countries and those have been most, mostly affected. So, um, the SDG um, is agenda and the gender agenda are still global. Um, they still gather a lot of support, but they are facing new challenges, especially from this year on. Thank you, thank you, Christina. Um, on the same on the same lines, um, second part of our report on rethinking multilater multilateralism is precisely devoted to the areas where. Uh, we could see a step forward um, uh, for collective action, for for providing uh, public goods, for enhancing multilateralism. In short, uh, Paul, could you uh, um, advance some of these areas, uh, some of these ideas that uh, would really lead us to rethink the sense of multilateralism? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, we we'll summarize some of the ideas that are uh, that can be drawn from the report that can help us uh, rethink and advance on multilateralism that what i think all the authors agree is that all crises 
but particularly the climate change emergency and the coronavirus emergency required uh, collective responses to, to address this crisis. And for this uh, collective action to be possible and meaningful and coherent, uh, a reform of the UN Security Council is necessary. But of course, this is a, is a long, it requires uh, negotiations, it requires agreement by great powers, and this is not, uh, negotiations have started, dialogue, but this is not, um, it's not going to take place in the, in the next, in the following years. So without a reform security council, um, the multilateralism that will emerge will not be as splendorous. And, and the UN will have to adapt to this, um, these international relations where consensus is, is difficult to achieve. So there are two ideas, I think, in this report uh, that can help us imagine how, how this multilateralism could be or, or um, yeah, how, how it could be. And the, the first is that the state-centric view of international relations must, must disappear. Uh, it is based on, a, on the, the chimera that, that states on their own can, can resolve uh, problems in international relations, but this is not, this is not gonna happen, of course and particularly in a, an interconnected uh, international relations. So, for instance, the, the, the chapter by, by Eva Garcia explains how the UN should engage further with local governance, uh, with the local level, as a means to, to solve uh, uh, wider, wider issues. Or um, Hannah Abdullah, for instance, explains how the UN has lost the idea of culture from from its from its agenda, where culture culture not not as a as a divisive uh, characteristic, but uh, culture as a constructive element that from our differences can, we can build um, consensus and constructive responses can be a good element for the UN to incorporate in its in its agenda or to reintroduce in its agenda. Or Edouard Soule, for instance, uh, that has been mentioned by Christina before, talks about. Uh, the need for multi-level alliances, the need for interregional cooperation as a means to, to further the agenda of multilateralism. Perhaps a, a multilateral world with uh, big responses cannot be imagined, but it can be, it can be advanced by focusing on, on different regions and different uh, problems at different levels. And the second idea I think that is, that is um, relevant for us to rethink multilateralism is the idea of sustainability. The UN has increasingly introduced it, but I think it, it, it um, I, I think I can explain it, how it can be uh, improved. The idea of sustainability uh, is relevant because crises do not, do not end or crises cannot be uh, analyzed as a, in compartment or as a, as, as crises that begin and end, but need to be, um, analyze and examine in all, its, in all its dimensions. So the idea of development, the idea of peace, but also the idea of security need to be understood through several areas, through several policy domains. And this is what, what the UN should be doing, right? Trying to relate the different, the different consequences, the different relations between areas to try to, um, to, to, try to address uh, problems more collectively. And I think or, for instance, the, the chapter by Anna Yuso on development, on the sustainable de development goals, the chapter which I've written on sustain sustaining peace are in that direction. How, how, the, how the agenda of sustaining peace or development can help us think of a, of a different international relations where there, are where there is cooperation between actors, but also between agendas and, and, and topics. Thanks, Paul. So, for for a final for a final words on this, uh, and and to what extent these agendas can be interlinked. Uh, the greatest example, of course, is COVID and climate change. Huh? We've heard so many times that this is only the first crisis to come, 
that uh, we're being tested at this point, that many more crises as a development of, of ice melting and new viruses in the atmosphere uh, coming up as a consequence of ice melting, as I was saying, or, um, or even uh, uh, illnesses coming from, um, from, from animals mutating into human beings, that these will only increase with, uh, with climate change. Is it really useful to think about uh, these two emergencies together when discussing the, 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 the prospects for, for multilateralism to advance uh, solutions and to provide for some uh, benefits when, when tackling this crisis? And I will turn to Marie for a few uh, last words on this and then we will wrap up uh, uh, soon after since we are almost an hour now from our uh, first dis uh, remarks. Marie, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Um, so, uh, yes, let's see, to bring this together. Um, I think COVID and climate change, we can uh, analyze the relation in two ways. One is in which way uh, uh, climate change is going to affect infectious diseases, um, how the way humans are altering their environments is increasing the contact between, of course, the, these two elements. I think that's one issue we can take. We can also discuss there, for example, the effect of the measures against coronavirus and what they what effect they had on emissions. Um, but uh, in this context of speaking about multilateralism, uh, I'd like to bring it more into the lessons that we can learn from how we addressed uh, COVID to how we need to address this, this next challenge. This challenge that's already ongoing that is already ongoing and that will be lasting for many, many decades still and affecting many generations. So uh, while I am, uh, while I was positive in my, in my last interact, uh, intervention about, uh, about this model of Paris, and, and I think at this point it's the best uh, possible alternative that we, that we have on the table, climate change is, is not solved, right? Um, and so let's take a look. Uh, I would say that there's maybe three uh, points that I could make regarding uh, the addressing COVID and addressing climate change. The first is uh, one that I already referred to. It's the importance of science. Scientists have been telling us for a long time what is happening with our climate system, yet we are very, very slow to respond. Uh, the same thing happened in a way uh, with regards to, to COVID-19. Uh, it was known that this risk could happen, yet we were not prepared. And so I think that's point number one, uh, the importance of science, the importance of incorporating science into policy uh, and so forth. The next thing is uh, the difficulty, basically, of addressing uh, such global issues. Um, so, I mean, these uh, both issues uh, are international issues which uh, basically respect no boundaries, even though you can close, perhaps, uh, a, a border at some point. I mean, basically, they do not respect uh, boundaries. Uh, they both require expensive solutions. Um, they, uh, they, they affect all human beings, yet the resilience that some uh, human beings have, some countries have with respect to both problems uh, can vary in function of their economies, in function of their geographical factors, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's many things that are quite similar. And so uh, you can see in both cases a, a problem that is very big, that is very global, and that you need international cooperation to solve. So you can see here the, the difficulties, the, how, how, how expensive, how, how difficult it was to solve uh, or to, to work towards solving COVID. Uh, the thing is that the, the final point I want to make, I'm afraid, is, is bleak. Um, because we were able to take quite drastic measures against uh, COVID uh, because it was such, uh, an, they had such immediate effects. Um, so it, um, it affected our neighbors, it affected our family members, and policymakers took actions that would have been absolutely unthinkable months before because of these direct impacts that they were seeing on their environment. And also, the solutions, uh, as in, for example, limiting the contact between people through lockdowns, had almost immediate effects. You could uh, protect your neighbors, your family, et cetera, et cetera. So although it was very, very expensive to do it, this immediate threat and this immediate impact on the ground uh, led to incredible actions. Now, the problem with climate change is, despite uh, the fact that many things are similar, the horizon is very, very different. So we're already seeing the impacts of climate change now, um, and, and the climate uh, emergency, as it is now being termed, in order to, to highlight, in fact, this issue of the horizon. Um, we're already seeing impacts on the ground, but they're not evenly spread. Um, they um, can be sometimes gradual, and humans are capable of adapting to gradual change. So it's, it's something that is not that this, the impact is not the same. And the impacts that are graver, uh, 
uh, are still to come, are, are in our near and medium future, um, but they're, they're not here yet. And so taking uh, expensive measures now for a problem that we're going to feel the effects of far in the future or not so far, only in 10, 20 years, we'll already start feeling these things, is very, very difficult uh, for humans and for policymakers. And so I'm afraid that that's uh, my less uh, positive uh, or, or optimistic part of the part of the debate. Uh, I worry that um, uh, that addressing climate change uh, is still going to be extremely difficult, and I only hope that we can draw some lessons uh, from how uh, COVID was was addressed. Thanks, Mary. You're uh, you're totally right. I think you make a very valid point here on the on the on the time management difficulty, right, related to um, to very uh, severe. Uh, action that needs to be taken uh, or that has been taken as a consequence of COVID and uh, and uh, more long-term uh, sort of needs that we uh, all um, that we will all have to confront but perhaps not tomorrow perhaps not next month but in the next years and it's very difficult for a government to think ahead uh, in terms of after uh, his or her term in office to think what needs to be done today so that the next one in office the next leader in office won't be suffering as much and this is not something that politicians very much appreciate they like to take credit of uh, and, 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 and 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 take and receive credit for what they do um today and not not necessarily four and five years time we have um a very uh couple of last minutes to, to end this discussion if anyone would like to raise some additional points we have a question now coming from patricia garcia duran that if there are not further points that you would like to make uh, get our dear panelists, I will introduce to you. And it's uh, the prospects of a trade war and, and, and what are uh, the, the possibilities for such trade war actually uh, happening um, and what effects will that necessarily have on multilateralism. Is there anyone who would like to address this question or to give uh, some final uh, thoughts about things that should have been said and have not been said so far. James, Christina, Paul, you can unmute your mics. And uh, I, I would just quickly, quickly offer to reinforce your point earlier, Paul, of the multi-levels at which the discussion and debate about multilateralism is already happening and will happen. And I think the trade war question is an example. In the United States, American opinion of China is at its lowest level since we've been measuring it. And that's a context, a factor in uh, this kind of multilateralism thinking. It's domestic politics, it's a bilateral relationship, and at the same time, it's a multilateral question and challenge. So I'll turn it over to other people. Thanks, uh, James. Paul, Christina, Marie, is there anything that you would like to add on this? Christina. Well, I guess we can just speculate. I think uh, a military war is now of any interest for of any of the parts, even if uh, there is a growing tension, even if uh, both China, well, the United States it has the largest uh, military power in the world and China is, is uh, building that uh, by the day. I don't think, um, I, I don't think uh, they, they, they are planning that. I mean, not even in, in a distant future because the consequences couldn't be, you cannot calculate. You always know when you get into a conflict, uh, you never know when you get out. Um, I don't think that is the way that either the United States or China is think, are thinking about uh, redefining multilateralism. But an accident can always happen, you know that. Absolutely. Paul, uh, Marie, final words? Yeah, I would like to, to go back to, to James' first question on are you optimistic or pessimistic about our multilateralism? And I thought, I was thinking that um, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, last week was very pessimistic. Uh, he had a somber tone on, on multilateralism. And I think he has even been criticized by that because he was uh, very crude on, on, on the prospects for multilateralism. Um, and he said, he, he gave the speech in, a, in an empty audience where there were no state leaders. Uh, there were only two representatives by each state. So it was, um, the Guardian called uh, the, the, the event as the worst 
event by the by the UN General Assembly. So in that sense, they were pessimistic, but I would I would not see it that way. I was I was thinking when I was seeing the event that um, that the event looked looked very credible more than ever. We we sometimes criticize the UN for being for lacking credibility, but that event uh, looked credible because there was the need to to enhance multilateralism to cooperate, uh, and and that credibility was precisely was given by the by the situation which n no state leaders had been able to to be there. Um, they were doing uh, pre-recorded videos. Uh, they were doing home office, so to speak, and and that made it very very weird. But at the same time, very credible that 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 was not uh, a commemoration. That was not a, a party, but that there was the need to actually to stay together and and start a sort of a, a cooperation or start thinking how to how to address uh, the, in that case the, the pandemic. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Marie, I think I have to give you the last word. The last word. So, so Florida, sorry. Thanks very much. Um, so just perhaps to, to pick up on, on uh, the point about the trade war, just a signal that uh, we've been speaking, of course, about multilateralism in the context of the UN in particular, but uh, trade multilateralism, I think, is one of those that uh, it also needs uh, some work. It's another one that's, that's under threat. And so I think that's a, that's a topic that uh, could deal with in a whole other webinar, uh, but uh, just to put that on the table. Perhaps just to, to round up, um, I think that uh, to end uh, on, on kind of an, an optimistic note uh, regarding the, the, Pew, the Pew study that James has, has presented, um, I think it is uh, encouraging to see the support uh, for the ideal of multilateralism and also to some degree for the practice, the practice of sometimes having to consider the interests of uh, other countries uh, in order to achieve global goals. Uh, and to see that among young people, I think, is also, is also quite important. Um, so to bring to come back to this question of, of, of leadership and where it's going to come from, at the very least, I think that we have uh, a groundswell that can be uh, worked from. So let's let's hope that that uh, that contributes. I like the fact that you all ended uh, with uh, positive notes uh, on 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 our discussion and, and ways forward. That's very good. We've reached our the end of our discussion a bit over an hour. We tend to keep it in uh, one hour, one hour and five minutes. It's been one hour and six minutes, so we're we're totally uh, fine within uh, schedule. Thank you very much, James. Uh, James Bell, who's uh, Vice President um, at the, of Global Strategy at Pure Research Center. Also, please uh, look at the report that Pure Research has just published uh, on, on the state of multilateralism and what do we all global community think about multilateralism. Thank you very much, Christina Manzano, Director of S Global. Uh, for, for joining the discussion as well. And Marie van der Drisha, you've been joining also uh, discussions lately organized by CIDOP, a senior researcher at the uh, We're very grateful that you all joined. Thank you all uh, very much. And thank you, special thanks to Paul Vargas, who has been leading the work on of CIDOP around this uh, UN at 75, I think, multilater multilateralism report that uh, has just come out. And all of them, all of these reports, uh, they're all uh, online, so I would encourage you to look at all the websites of all the organizations here, Pew Research, as Global, the SADEF here on CIDOP, and you'll find some uh, additional and interesting analysis on multilateralism and other global issues. So thank you all, thank you all for joining. Thank you to the audience uh, for being patient and listening to us. And let's tune in for next webinar sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye.